This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Welcome, everybody, to Wells Tech. This is episode 495, recorded on May 2nd, 2017. I'm Martin Spriggs, and we're here to talk about technology and ministry. And when I say we, I mean me and, of course, Sally Draper. Hi, how are you, Sally? Fabulous. Happy day. It's uh, sunshiny and probably going to be close to 90 degrees down here in lovely Natchez, Mississippi. Very good. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't really matter where we are because uh, we do this show from all manner of locations as long as we have our trusty technology with us, uh, all the way up to show 495, headed toward that uh, very special 500 number. Uh, it's kind of amazing even to think about. We've been doing this for a long, long time, but the amazing, the even more amazing thing about it is we find uh, stuff to talk about each and every week. And the topic for the day, very timely topic as we approach summer and vacation, is tech support for family and friends. Uh, I would I would venture a guess that most of the people that listen to this show have been pressed into tech support for family and friends duty at least once or twice uh, over the years. What do you think? Yeah, I personally can attest to the fact that I've had to do it. I do it when I am vacationing and hoping to take a little break from <laughs> technology. But you certainly want to help out those that you care about and um and try to keep things running smoothly for them. I think vacation time is great. You can make a lot of progress, but then the tech support has to continue, and oftentimes that's at a distance. So, you know, things to put in place that'll help make that easy when you're further away is probably one of my main concerns. Yep. And there's all manner of support. Sometimes, you know, the uh, those needing support are around the corner. Sometimes they're around the world. But uh, I think we're just going to talk about some tips and tricks that uh, maybe we've learned over the years. And hopefully our audience will share theirs as well as, uh, as the show comes out. But uh, there are just some basic things that are you know, mostly common sense, but it's good to kind of think through them and uh, note them as you're going out and trying to maintain a healthy computing environment for those we love. So uh, we should probably start by saying there's a couple of, it's a little more complicated than it used to be. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we'd go and there was just a a lone computer there, sometimes not even connected to the internet, which made it uh, even a lot easier uh, to uh, Mm -hmm. to make sure it was a safe environment and something that was working for, for the family or friend. But now we have not just computers, but we have tablets, we have phones, all of those need attention as well. But I think uh, we're going to focus mostly on the computer side because I think that's where a lot of folks get into the most trouble. Fortunately, tablets and phones have kind of locked down uh, operating systems, so their maintenance is is not quite as uh, demanding, uh, although there are some some tips and tricks there too. So maybe, Sally, the the way where I would start is making sure that disaster doesn't strike. And what I mean by that is making sure that uh, the family member or the friend has a reliable backup. Yeah, that's probably about the worst thing that could happen is to lose your hard drive if you're um, in a computing environment. And so, yeah, reliable backups are great. I actually um, just packed up my dad's backup solution. He had an external hard drive. We helped him set this up several years ago, and, um, and it had some software with it where it would automatically copy any file changes or additions to the external drive. Obviously, they're probably a lot smaller these days, but yep, um, that's a great... that we use here in the Senate office a lot, the uh, sure. Western Digital My Passport kind of fits in. You know, I mean, it's a maybe the size of a big pack of cards, 
but uh, it doesn't require power, just USB plugs mm -hmm. in. They're very inexpensive. I think this is a, a two terabyte model, it's certainly under a hundred bucks, but well worth it. And uh, you know, maybe even uh, something that you bring along and you leave uh, because it is going to save you a lot of time and suffer uh, uh, pain and suffering if if something goes wrong and, and one of these backups isn't available. So that's probably mm -hmm. uh, one of the easiest ways, you know, just plug it in and then install the appropriate software to to obviously make this happen automatically. That's probably the key to the whole setup, right? Definitely. Um, and you can also use cloud-based solutions for doing that automatic backup. Uh, one that pops to mind, I think you're probably really familiar with, Martin, is Backblaze. Right. Um, yeah. And again, it's kind of set it up and let it do its thing. Is that correct? Right. And it's one of the cheapest ones. I think it's about 50, 60 bucks and it is unlimited storage. So one of the, uh, obviously on the negative side of cloud-based backups is, uh, if you need to restore an entire drive, for instance, uh, there's a little more uh, energy needed and sometimes a little bit of cost to uh, get that data from the cloud. You can download it little bits at a time, but there's also services, Backblaze has this, where you pay you know a certain amount of money, they send you all your stuff on a thumb drive or a hard drive, and then if as long as you return the hard drive, you get some of that money back. But uh, that's probably the one. I, if, I, if I had to pick one, uh, that's probably what I would say is maybe the, the highest priority is get something off-site, get something that just works in the background so that uh, uh, the person that you're supporting doesn't have to remember, you know, to click a button or to run a program. It just is it's always going on in the background. And some of those can be, uh, some of those kinds of softwares can be set up for the local uh, external hard drives like we talked about. Mm -hmm. I know on the Mac uh, you have Time Machine that can work pretty well by itself and Windows has its own backup solution which does that automatically as well but uh, there really is no solution for something that just stores takes care of you know not having something in the same room as the computer so a fire flood happens whatever uh, you, you've got that backup probably another reason to have backups other than just kind of uh, hard drive failure is uh, you know ransomware those kinds of things to be able to go back in time to get a uh, you know a previous backup if the, the if the current operating system is unavailable to you or a piece of it like would happen with ransomware. You know, I'm just um, realizing as you're talking there, Martin, that we really are. Um, in a different age than the last time we probably talked about supporting our families and friends or talking about online or cloud-based backups and that many people are shifting to cloud-based operating systems like Google Chrome and by doing that they really don't have the local software that they're super concerned right. about losing and so cloud. it's more about files it's more about photos and documents and things like that and so having just a good photo backup solution you know for my mom that would probably be her number one priority get all the photos backed up and so tools like um, Google Photos can just automatically sync a folder that you designate and things like that so it could be a mixture of these. You could have the Backblaze doing the whole big picture and then um, individual files and things, you know, automatically syncing to a Google Drive, a Google Photos, or other similar cloud-based solutions. And I'm hearing, and now that you brought it up and uh, I'd like your reaction too, I'm hearing more and more people maybe recommend uh, things like Chromebooks uh, to, to their parents or grandparents because it truly is, uh, there really is nothing on board. Almost every piece of content is already in the cloud, a lot less to go wrong, so the hardware is, is not hard to support. Um, what do you think about uh, Chromebooks for some of those situations? Yeah, I think so, um, especially with now the, the ones with touchscreen, they have the ability to have all the Android apps on them, so you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. Um, they feel like they're getting a computing experience, which maybe they're a little more comfortable with a regular keyboard and those right. kind of things, but they can do the tablet-based applications and things. So I think that's a win-win-win when I'm supporting um, really mom time. who needs, yeah, um, yeah needs to do what she wants to do and doesn't want to hassle with a lot of trouble. So, And uh, the bonus there is Chromebooks are probably going to be cheaper mm -hmm. than uh, some other 
non-Chromebook type solutions. If you go with a Mac or a PC, uh, you've got additional costs there, additional hardware that you need to support and uh, keeping the operating system up to date. Chromebooks just kind of do that all in the background. That, that mm -hmm. sounds like a winner to me too. I think there are some limitations. I know when I'm thinking of supporting my mom, she has a, uh, um, a family tree uh, piece of software, software that she's been working mm -hmm. with for years and years that uh, I don't think is in the cloud. So you've got some of those edge cases. So you kind of have to figure out what their uses are and see if a Chromebook would, would meet those needs. But I think more and more the answer is, yeah, a lot of that stuff is in the cloud. And it also kind of eliminates, at least at this point, a lot of issues with virus protection. So if you're on a traditional computer, laptop, whatever, um, you're going to definitely want to make sure you've installed and maintained virus protection on those systems. And I don't think you have such problems with Chromebooks. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. No, I don't. I don't know that there is that kind of software even available that runs at least natively on those systems. That's a good question. But mm -hmm. if you are on a Windows system or a, or a Mac, the, the software is out there. Windows 10 um, has it available. I think it's becoming easier and easier. It's on by default Windows Defender. Uh, but there are also tools that come along with most PCs that you buy too, McAfee or Norton, those kinds of things are, are, are all out there. And uh, that would be something that you'd want to look at right away when you're doing your, your home tech inspection um, and figuring <laughs> out if they've got that and if it's on and what it's found and if it's got the latest uh, uh, updates to it, you know, so that would be something that uh, that I would always check along with all the other updates to the operating system. Just make sure that the antivirus is is there up to date. Uh, if you're paying for it, just make sure that the subscription is active. Those kinds of things, and uh, uh, hopefully, those are kind of behind the scenes stuff as well. But they will, um, you know, they will jump in front of some of those viruses if they're if they're well configured. Definitely. Um, I guess, unless the computer's just totally messed up with a virus, one of the things that I rely heavily on is being able to see and control my mom's computer when I'm trying to support her from afar. And there are software, uh, there's different um, software solutions out there that'll allow you that remote control access to computers. A couple that jumped to mind for me are TeamViewer and Join.me. I've used both of these solutions um, successfully with my parents. Probably the biggest challenge is getting it running on their system so that they can, you know, give me control. And we usually go over that. I have some instructions written for them and things like that so they can get it started. Um, but I, I do have a new one to add to this category. Something that um, has been a big benefit more recently is to actually have them use their cell phone or tablet and take a photo of the screen. So if you can't make screen sharing work, you can at least see what's on the screen. They can take a photo and, and share that with you, an email or in a text app or whatever it may be. Very Options there yeah. to see what they're doing. Yeah, you could eat and if you're using, you know, the appropriate uh phone technology, there are things like FaceTime or Google Hangouts, those kinds mm -hmm. of things that could be used from uh, from mobile devices too. That's kind of the hardest thing, right, is trying to see what's on their screen. It's very difficult, and mm -hmm. we deal with it all the time when trying to support people, you know, in our Senate positions here too, you know, having them describe what's on their screen and us trying to visualize what's on their screen, sometimes there's a lot lost in translation. So there really is no substitute of, to getting to the same view of the same thing. And it goes just, it just goes so much faster. I wouldn't even probably spend much time at all trying to have somebody communicate what's on their screen, what they're seeing. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> but my mom really likes to try. Hey, do you know of any um, Mac kind of comparable tools to do the, yeah, the remote with, control uh, the screen sharing? Or iMessage that you can have uh, turnover screen control, which I didn't know till just a you know, a little while ago, and it works pretty well. I use TeamViewer with my mom, uh, and uh, I, when I was down there, I don't know, four or five years ago, I set up TeamViewer in host mode so that it's always running in the background. So she doesn't actually have to do anything, and she's comfortable with me jumping on there and installing updates and whatever. As long as her computer is on, this thing is active, and I just know the code and the password to get in there. 
uh, and then I can install the, you know, the browser updates and the operating system updates. And if it calls for a reboot, um, it comes back. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll be offline, obviously, as it's rebooting. But once it's back up, then uh, her computer will pop up again in my TeamViewer client. And uh, I'll have options for um, uh, transferring files and taking screenshots and those kinds of nice. things as well. Nice. Mm -hmm. Speaking of passwords, I'm guessing that you have that host password saved in a tr in a trusted password safe solution. That's I personally use LastPass. Yeah, we use I use LastPass, but there's <laughs> others one password, etc. But yeah, that's probably a great practice to have is to try and uh, keep track of your friend or family members' pass, you know, important passwords at least, so that you mm -hmm. know, they lose it, forget it, uh, something happens. Um, they have you as a backup, and if you are in there for support, uh, you don't have to have them go hunt down the password. You, uh, you've you already got it. Uh, there needs to be some kind of coordination there, so if they're changing it for whatever reason, you know, the system forces them to change it, uh, and it's good practice to change passwords that you're capturing that as well. But uh, it's a really great idea. One password that is kind of important for me is the, the Wi-Fi password so that when I go down on vacation or whatever, uh, she doesn't have to hunt that. Uh, I mean, she does. She never has to enter it because it's kind of baked into you know her computer or device. But I may have to enter it to get online with with my equipment. So that's something that that I tuck in there as well, along with the, all the other stuff for email passwords and those kinds of things are really helpful to have. Yeah, I've got one that's important to me as well that I wanted to make mention of, and that's. Um, email password specifically because many many uh, password resets now are tied to your email and so um, if there was really you know a push come to shove thing and I couldn't get access to an account I could log in temporarily to her email address and set for her so I think email is one that's that's high on my list of being able to know and and maintain um, for my yep. distant relatives so what do you do about uh, helping them maintain their own passwords? Do you get them set up with <laughs> LastPass, or do, you know, do they have any kind of system, or what's uh, what's your plan uh, for supporting that kind of thing? I'm like you. I actually save her passwords in my LastPass, and so typically, it's just easier that way. I don't think that LastPass would be something that should want to hassle with and everything. So for me, I just know the important ones. Like I said, email is at the top of my list. If I can get to that, I can get to most everything else. So I will say that if you're uh, supporting somebody who is comfortable with those kinds of things, and they're getting mm -hmm. easier and easier, uh, LastPass, I know, and 1Password both do this, allow you to share uh, information so you can say hey I'm going to share you know these passwords with you so that you're working off of the same database versus two different databases and trying to keep them in sync so uh, there are advantages to using the same technology and uh, enabling some of those sharing features with those password managers yeah that reminds me also of setting up a fallback person to get access to your LastPass. I'm not sure what the process is called in their terminology, but you can designate someone who can log into your LastPass if you haven't done so in a period of time. Yep. That's probably good to set up as well, so you can get access to everything of theirs if something were to happen to, to them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they, they work on a time-based system, so mm -hmm. if you as the uh, uh, support person logs into their last pass there's a there's a button you can press and then an email an email will get sent this is how last pass works at, at, at least an email gets sent to the person and if they don't respond to it in a certain number of days and you can configure that that window uh then you get enabled access but all this has to be set mm -hmm. up you know, beforehand so right right so check that out Mm -hmm. Sally, one really important area, and this improves the, ex the computing experience of the people that we're supporting, is just kind of the education side. Help them to use and benefit from the technology uh, and help them to be a little bit more self-sufficient. So it's obviously a better deal if they can figure out and troubleshoot their own issues or, or know what's going on with their own computer or devices versus having to call you or set up a session or whatever. And this is easier than ever too. All kinds of tools, depending on what kind of learner 
uh, the person is. Uh, I like to use screencasts and screen captures. The visuals mm -hmm. are really helpful as long as they can play a, a video or something uh, or take a look at some images and some step throughs. Uh, I think that's really helpful because there are a number of things that they don't have to do very often and if they mm -hmm. uh, come across it six months every six months or once a year they've got to do this thing they're not going to remember um so it's really helpful to yeah. give them some of those helps and i know you've done some of this stuff with uh uh with people that you support via via ipad right some of the things yeah that's right um i'm remembering when my mom got her ipad i actually had it shipped to me and i I did a lot of screencast and and recorded things on web pages. Set up a a Google site just for her, privatized just for her, and it had you know step by step. It had important links saved on it, things like that. And then I made an icon on her on her home screen of her tablet, so she could easily get to that. She didn't have to type in a web address or anything. Uh, put the shortcut right there on the home screen, and that worked really well. Um, you know especially it can be really overwhelming and it takes a while before you start to click with it and then you know kind of want to go further or learn more at first you're just trying to survive the new experience and so it's hard to just bombard someone with all the information they need and having it available in that kind of format like you described um, can be a real benefit yeah and try and keep them bite-sized you know don't uh, record a 45 minute video just keep it you know, on topic and name them appropriately and then just leave some kind of written documentation as to how to get to those help resources, I mm -hmm. think it's helpful as well. So Sally, maybe the last category, and maybe this is the toughest because it requires uh, perhaps being on site and that's maintaining the physical hardware. How do you maintain the hardware? How do you support the hardware, you know, replacing hard drives and, uh, you know, RAM issues and those kinds of things always come up. Uh, I know when I was last down with my mom, um, she was getting some overheating problems with her computer. And uh, the, the reason for it was just all the gunk, the dust and whatever that had mm -hmm. collected, you know, in the vents and uh, taking some canned air or whatever and, uh, you know, blowing that out and cleaning everything off. Uh, seem to to resolve the problem. So there's different things like that that if you can help them, you know, jot down a list of things that they should do every so often just to kind of keep things humming along. But ultimately, maybe the best advice is just to keep the hardware as simple as possible. We talked about Chromebooks before. We talked about one thing that uh, I kind of lean toward is fanless devices. Uh, so the, mm. the MacBook that I currently use has no fan, so there's not going to be an issue with, with that going on. It seems like that's one of the areas there where there's a lot of problems. If they're using an iPad, those kinds of things pretty much kind of run along by themselves without a lot of maintenance necessary. So make smart choices on the hardware selection side side up front. Maybe don't cheap out too much in that area because that's going to come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just picturing you using a team viewer to spray that can of air and clean that that's stuff up. Does Yes. <laughs> And work too well. moms that are states and states away mine's in florida yours is in mississippi so you know we don't get down there certainly as often as we like but uh right. trying to get them an environment that they that they're comfortable with and works for them without you being there is, is pretty important definitely this this episode should be dedicated to wells tech moms because that's who we're <laughs> focusing on supporting here and i know it's true for everybody that's listening i know you've got a mom and dad or or some distant um people at a well, distance sometimes that it's you're even trying a to spouse. support um yeah there's 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 no age you know kind of category there's just some people who don't have the time or the desire to to kind of get to know the technology enough to truly support themselves and uh you know that's why uh god has given us the opportunity to serve so and that's fine I like doing it that's right yeah uh, one more note i just am laughing because sitting next to me under the hard drive i picked up is my dad's cpu and i can remember him actually mailing it to me once because it needed um attention and then we mailed it back because oh we were gosh, at such a yeah. distance so where there's a will there's a way and compute and you know, 
Computers are a necessity. I would say they are a necessity for many things mm-hmm. these days. And and uh, regardless of age, there are they are great communication devices to stay connected with family and friends. We want to be able to to provide that. So definitely good chat. So uh, like I said at the beginning, if you have other advice or things that you do to help. Uh, your tech support efforts for family and friends, share those with the show. Wells Tech at wells.net would be a great place to email those thoughts. Go on our listserv or our Google groups, I guess we'd, we'd, do, we'd go to now, or go on the show notes page, leave a comment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let us know what you're doing. Sally, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're counting down to 500. We're at 495, so only uh, four more episodes till it's upon us. And uh, what we've been doing for each of these episodes leading up is kind of doing a year in review since we started. Um, And uh, we're up to year five, which would have been 2012. And uh, one of the fun things that we've been doing is taking a look at our picks of the week. That kind of gives us an idea of what technology was hot or what we felt was good at the time. And uh, our picks for 2012, uh, we, we did a little bit something different and that was we did seven (laughs) best picks of 2012 apparently there were so many awesome picks we had that year that we couldn't limit it to maybe just the top three we had to take seven anything strike you in your seven well yeah it was a pretty good year for technology in terms of um, what's reflected in my top seven of the year i um, talked about the raspberry pi that was probably the beginning of this microcomputing phase really affordable um that you could build into pretty much anything you want we've talked about the maker movement on the show and um, it all started back in 2012 or thereabouts with um, the introduction of Raspberry Pi so we got a Raspberry Pi I can remember uh, several different projects that we involved it in currently it's in a a game mode we call it um, the win rama and you have buttons and you can press the button and it'll light up that you pressed in first. So you can do all kinds of fun things with a Raspberry Pi. Also reference math counts and uh, maybe not so much technology, although they have great video tutorials and um, resources that you can make use of. But that was a really fun program that we got introduced to um, in 2012. And my number one, giving me a big monkey grin, was Pig Monkey. So a f- talked about picnic being my number one and it was um, bought out and sadly and it, w- it didn't take too long before pick monkey came on the scene and and filled in that gap and still loving it today so still a number one pick of mine yeah Our how was your 2012 give us a historical retrospective on when technology <laughs> started so that, that's interesting it's pretty cool yeah mm-hmm. um Again, 2012, what, like you mentioned, was a very good year. I think almost everything that I picked uh, is, is still going strong. We, uh, we talked a little bit about Camtasia, one of our favorite products. Uh, they they uh, released a, a new version. I talked a couple about a couple things about Google, Google two-step uh, verification, which we still recommend today, just an extra step of safety between mm-hmm. you and uh, somebody getting access to your stuff through your Google account. Google Drive uh, was just kind of coming into its own at that point. Uh, my number one was also so Google, Google Hangouts, which uh, kind of make this show go. <laughs> uh, we didn't Here always we use Google Hangouts. We started... Um, well, did we have we always used Google Hangouts? I know we've used Skype or used Skype at least initially to do audio recording. I don't know if when we jumped to video, we went right to Google Hangouts. We probably did, but uh, it has we did. Uh, well over the years. So um, and I don't know if we we didn't start recording these shows in 2012. I have to go back into the way back yeah. and figure out when we started. But Google Hangouts is uh, has been a uh, a real blessing to those people who uh, find that video conferencing is useful for, for all kinds of things, including ministry. So Definitely. Google was big back in 2012. Definitely a very good year. 
I just looked back at our summer of 2012, we did something called a software showcase and we focused on different software all summer long. So it would probably be neat to go back and look at all those software solutions and see how many of them are still around as well. But a uh, fun year and it brought us up to episode 268. Um, so more than halfway to 500 by the end of 2012. All right, I'm looking forward already to next week when we do 2013. Let's move on to news in tech. And Amazon has been in the news. Uh, we've talked about the Amazon Echo before, and uh, they are going to be launching a new product called Echo Look. Sally, what did uh, what do you think of the Echo Look? Well, I think it's going to help me with my fashion forward consciousness stuff because it looks like the look has a camera and they'll give you uh, advice on how well you are dressed. I, I don't know. Ministry applications? I'm not sure. Maybe you want to check yourself before you go on that um that call or go to school that day or whatever. Yeah, check if your stole is straight before you head out. <laughs> That's right. Train Alexa. All right. Uh, so, well, I don't remember when they said that's going to be released. Maybe they didn't even have one. Maybe they did, but it uh, is probably not too far into the future. So if you're into the Echo stuff, that could be the next step forward. We probably should remind everybody about uh, upcoming streaming that is available from our Synod schools. There's always concerts, there's graduations, there's call services, and they're all going to be streamed. We're not going to walk through all of the myriad of uh, potential events that are out here, but uh, we will put all of these in the show notes um, because there's a bunch of them. I think the earliest one is, what, May 12th, I want to say, and that's up right. at MLC. That's MLC right. is usually the first one out of the... Uh, out of the shoot, and they have a concert, a commencement concert, May 12th uh, at 4 o'clock and at 7.30, and those will be streamed. And then it goes on from there. We have LPS, uh, Luther Preparatory School, MLC, Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and Michigan Lutheran Seminary all have stuff that they'll be streaming. So you may want to mark those on your calendar. Yep, exciting times. Busy times. <laughs> Let's move on to our picks of the week. Time for me to do a little screen sharing. I had all my tabs open today and I didn't end up sharing a thing. So got to get in at least one. Uh, my pick of the week is a podcast that I enjoy called Stuff You Missed in History Class. It's from How Stuff Works. And it's been going for quite a while. They don't number their shows the way we do, Martin, but uh, they put out two shows a week. And I looked in the iTunes, um, and there were 300 shows um, in their archive there, but I'm pretty sure they have more than that. So um, um, show, it doesn't have any particular length, maybe 30 minutes to 50 minutes, depending on the topic that they're exploring. But they get real in depth on certain um, years or events. I listened to some as I was driving down to Mississippi about the Red Scare in the era. Um, what I'm seeing here on the screen is uh, uh, Abbott and Costello and how they rose to fame and what their careers were like. Um, Walt Whitman, poet of democracy and um, things like that. So um, Lots of cool stuff on Stuff You Missed in History Class. It's pretty in-depth and uh, tidbits that they discuss. They they go back to original documents, they bring in experts, um, and they tell the story of history, make it come alive for you. And so I would recommend Stuff You Missed in History Class. Have you ever listened, Martin? I have not. That sounds like a great way to, uh, to bone up on history in a kind of yeah. a fun and creative way. And if you go to their website, you can zero in on particular time periods or topics. Um, you know, they have British history, they have entertainment history, they have the 18th century. Anything that you're looking for, you can probably just drill down to and kind of immerse yourself in particular topics. So just all kinds of um, interesting things there. Very neat. 
Uh, my pick of the week is something that I don't think I've ever done before in 495 shots at picks of the week, and that is to mm. pick a movie. Uh, Debbie and I had a chance to uh, had some time on, uh, I think it was Sunday night, to uh, sit at home and pick a movie to watch, and we rented uh, my pick, which is Hidden Figures. Have you seen the show? Let me ask you that first. I have not. I wanted to when it was in theaters, but I never made it. So it's worth it, huh? And, and the reason I'm picking it, first of all, it's an awesome movie. I think it's really well done. It's uh, And when, uh, when I pick a movie, I normally lean toward uh, something that is historical in nature, something that's based on a true story, and this certainly is. Hidden Figures is about um, a... a uh, it's about NASA in the early 60s uh, during the space race. And uh, the, the main figures uh, in, the, in the movie, the, the main characters, are these African-American uh, gals who are um, very extremely smart. They are you know, math yeah, they have math brains, and they're employed by NASA. They called them computers. Uh, Mm -hmm. I thought was kind of interesting. So their position was mm -hmm. called computer. This was actually before computers. In fact, in the show, the first IBM mainframe was installed at NASA. And one of uh -huh. the uh, lead characters uh, learned how to program it and, and brought all of uh, her friends and co-workers into the system and kind of kept them in jobs because uh, this big IBM mainframe needed uh programmers. Um, so it's very interesting in that respect. The reason that I'm picking it is it's obviously more than just uh, about uh, NASA. It's about uh, racism. It's about sexism because you were, you know, and you were, uh, this was in Virginia. So you, they were right in the heart of kind of the, the racial conflict and Martin Luther King and, um, and uh, they were also ladies, so there was a lot of sexism there, especially they were in a very male-dominated environment, a lot of engineers, um, a lot of military uh, in, in NASA at that time. And uh, this, this really is all about STEM and using your gifts and the opportunities that you have to use your gifts for things that maybe you never connected the dots for. So maybe just an encouragement to to all of us, to, it's not a very far stretch to take a look at the gifts that you have and figure out how best to use them um, here to uh, get a man on the moon. Uh, but uh, I think in our conversation, Sally, we found that uh, there are many applications for technology and ministry. So just because uh, perhaps you didn't choose necessarily to be a pastor or a teacher, uh, maybe you, you are interested in technology, you have many opportunities to serve uh, in a very special way using that passion and those gifts. And I think you and I are kind of in that boat where we have opportunities to serve uh, in technology and ministry. You know, not an exact uh, correlation to this particular story, but it is very inspiring and, and very educational. So if you get a chance to, uh, uh, to see it or rent it, highly, highly recommend it. It's very clean. Um, I think it's pretty close to accurate and just kind of an inspirational story about uh, overcoming obstacles and um, the, importance of, uh, the importance of math. Right. Uh, so it's uh, go it's, math. Go math. Uh, so <laughs> Hidden Figures is the name of the movie. I forget what it's rated. Is it PG or PG 13? Uh, PG. Um, so uh, certainly a family friendly movie that uh, I think everybody should watch. Excellent. Thanks for so the don't pick. Take me 495 episodes to recommend a movie. I've done books before, but never a movie. So yeah, very That's good. Great. Um, speaking of movies, I'm down here in Mississippi. I'm going to miss the Martin Luther movie, which is playing tomorrow night in New Ulm, Minnesota at the movie theater. So I bought my ticket, but it is not going to happen for me. So Kevin will be going without me, Kevin and the kids. Last so. week, uh, Bethlehem in the Falls here uh, rented out uh, Marcus Theater in Menominee Falls and filled up the place. And uh, awesome. Uh, we saw it uh, last week, Wednesday. So well done. Okay. Should we Very move on good. to ministry resources? Yep. Going to share my screen again because I got to make use of that screen sharing right. stuff. Um, 
quick look at the article that we recently released and it's all about church copyright. So probably um, one of the most consistent questions we've received throughout almost 500 episodes of WellStack has been about church copyright. And for good reason, because it's a very complex subject. So what we've done in this article is tried to pull together some resources to help you um, in your congregation get up to speed on copyright and how it affects um, you know, what you're doing there, particularly if you're considering live streaming and podcasting, um, archiving, but also if you're just doing regular worship and you want to make sure you're in compliance, um, certainly um, one should be um, exploring. One thing that I kind of came around to as I revisited these resources, Martin, was the fact that it probably is in a church's best interest to actually designate a copyright officer of, per se, someone who's going to take on understanding this and diligently pursue um, and ensure that you're in compliance with copyright law by having the right um, licenses in place and also the right disclaimers that indicate the licensing that is in place and reporting it to the licensing agencies when you use particular songs. I mean, it's not um, for the faint hearted. You need to really invest some time and thought process into being in compliance with copyright law in a church. So I hope that our listeners will you know, dig into some of these resources. There's some really great resources out there um, that'll help you get educated and then, um, you know, make the best decisions from there. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think uh, having somebody designated to pay attention to this, even if it's just policing, because it's very difficult to kind of centralize and make sure all content is sanitized before it gets on the web or Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just have somebody have their eye open and, and, uh, you know, identify those things that uh, maybe aren't kosher that need to be taken care of. And then, you know, the whole education side is is incredibly important. Just taking the time to put together the resources, send out, you know, the email once in a while saying, hey, this is what you need to watch out for. Here are some safe places to get resources or techniques, uh, those kinds of things. So take a look at that uh, blog post Sally put together. Thank you, Sally. Mm -hmm. Sally, we have a featured video this week. We do, and actually it circles back to something that you mentioned as we were having our discussion on supporting uh, family and friends with technology, and that is it's really great to share with them um, instructions, step-by-step, -step, screencast videos, those kind of things. And the good news is that you don't always have to create those yourself or from scratch. Um, you can oftentimes rely on the help resources that are available for particular software solutions, whatever it may be. And I found a great example to include in our show notes this week. It's a 42 second video from LastPass and it's titled Meet the browser extension. So if you haven't experienced LastPass, this little short video very succinctly <laughs> demonstrates and explains how um, easy it is to use and what kind of functions it will um, if you install their inst extension and tie it to your LastPass account. So check out the video, um, check out their um, the LastPass uh, account on YouTube because they have lots of great video tutorials out there and certainly um, can help you get up to speed very quickly. Excellent. Uh, 496 is just around the corner next week. We will be continuing or con I should say concluding our um, series on social media in ministry. We'll be talking with Pastor James Aderman from here in Milwaukee. Uh, Pastor Aderman uh, took it upon himself to create, uh, coming out of our Wells Tech conference two years ago, uh, a Facebook page called Wells Intersection. So we'll be talking to him a little bit about that and uh, about uh, how congregations can take advantage of social media. Um, so you'll want to tune in next week for our conversation about that. We already told you how to contribute to the show. Please do that. Wellstech.wells.net is a place to go for all the show notes and uh, to get in touch with us. And we would love your feedback. We'll have a community feedback show in a few weeks. So uh, make sure you're getting your voice heard and contributing to 
the conversation. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Sally, for your work and uh, look forward to joining you again for 496 and all of you as well. Please uh, join us again and spread the word that Wells Tech exists. And uh, we're here each and every week. Take care and uh, blessings. Bye-bye.